John chapter 19, John 19, and, um, and I tell you what I want to do before we jump in is I, I want to pray over this message because I think this message has such profound implications on so many people's lives, and, um, and something you may not know if you're new to church is that, the, that really more than what is preached, it's more important on how it's received. And what co- happens in your heart, and, and, and the idea that, w- that your heart is available and open to it, that really matters a lot more than even what I get up here to say, uh, because I can say some really great things, and, and it never make it into your life because your heart's not prepared to receive it. So let's just pray together, and, and you could just simply pray, God, I just want everything that you have for me today out of your word. So Father, we come to you today, and we just ask that you would give us ears to hear. Lord Jesus, I pray that our hearts would be turned on to the revelation of Scripture. I pray that it would change our lives, that it would not be something that we simply hear and file away, but God, it would change the way we live, the way we walk, the way we handle our lives in every way, shape, and form. Lord, I pray that there wouldn't be a person here that's not affected to the good by your word today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, when I was in fifth grade, um, I had a crush on a girl named Tara. It is true that Kayla has not been the only girl in my life. There was Tara as well in fifth grade. But here's the thing. I was extremely intimidated and fearful when it came to Tara. I mean, I wouldn't even talk to her hardly. But one day there was a glimmer of hope that that Tara and I could be together. And it came in this form that we were given an assignment. And the assignment was that every student had to fill out some of their favorite things on a sheet. So, So, you know, favorite football team, favorite music, favorite snacks. And when these uh, papers were returned to the students, by by divine supernatural function, I got Tara's paper. Now, this was terrific because I now had the how-to manual when it came to Tara, this girl who I had such affection for. And, And I just thought in my mind, if I can become what she likes, She'll like me. And, and so the, the, I went home and, and read through it. And the next day, I came to school with a, a, on an old another level of swag. I mean, I was just ready. My game was prepared. It was ready to go. I, I had wore, her, the, my shirt was her favorite color. I had I had, I had memorized some stats about her favorite football team. And I, best of all, I brought some snacks. And they were her favorite snacks in my lunchbox. Because, I mean, after all, what girl? is not going to fall head over heels for the guy who brings their favorite snacks and can quote their team's quarterback rating. I mean, right? It's just, it's a perfect storm. And so the moment of truth comes and I go up to Tara and I, I'm just beaming with confidence and, and I just start the conversation with, hey, um, what's your, uh, your favorite color? You know, kind of just wanting her to notice my green shirt. I'm wearing this green shirt. And, and quickly Tara says, Pink. And I'm sitting here thinking, no, 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 your paper says green. I wear a green shirt. It, it can't be pink. And so I, I think, well, there's, there's something wrong. I ask a follow-up question. Well, what's your favorite snack? And, and, and she says, chocolate. Now, the problem is, is that her paper said taffy. And, and, and I, that's all I've got is taffy. And so very quickly, my plan is going down the drain, and I decide to abandon ship. I just excuse myself from the conversation, and I, I don't know that I've ever talked to Tara since that day. It just it was too much to overcome. And, but there are three things that I learned about this, three life lessons that I learned from this, this interaction. And the first one is this, that stalking is not the best dating strategy not the best, you know. I mean, I've tried it. It didn't work that well. The second one, and, and I think I'm going to get a lot of men who, who agree with this one. Women change their minds a lot. That Early on, I, 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 you know, I kind of learned that. And, and here's the final one, that the fear of people will cause you to do some crazy things. That the, the fearing people will cause you to do some pretty crazy things. Um, you know, the fear of disapproval from someone you care about or someone that's in your life is an extremely powerful force in your life. I mean, there are many, many, many people. I would go as far to say every person in this room at some point has had to deal with, with wanting the approval of a family member, a friend, or a coworker. That, that, that you've lived in a way that you desire that approval. You fear not having that approval. And you know, everyone, and, and I want to make sure I, we understand what I'm talking about. Everyone has dealt with peer pressure. That's nothing new. Everyone has second-guessed a decision based on someone else's opinion. 
But the fear of people is, is, is a really unique thing because we're not talking about you changing your opinion because someone else. We're talking about you changing who you are because of someone else. Like, we're not just saying a small adjustment. We're saying you start living your, your life in a direction that doesn't look like your decisions, but looks like someone else's desires. And, and, and this is really a, a, a very dangerous, dangerous thing that exists in our lives. I think for some of us, we're so comfortable with it that we don't even think anything about it. But, but the truth is it's very dangerous because here's what we're doing. In, in, we're basically putting ourselves in a position to choose between Christ's desires for our lives and a crowd's desires for our lives. You see, every time that, that you have a decision to make and you look for the crowd's approval over Christ's approval, the fear of people is planted in your heart deeper and deeper. And there's no better picture than this in all of Scripture than John chapter 19. I love this passage today because of what we're talking about. You see, let me give you a little background before we jump in. Um, Jesus has been arrested by their Jewish religious leaders. He's been arrested and falsely accused, and he's being brought, they've brought him in because basically his teachings, his following, continue to, to threaten their power structure. And so they want to see him killed. Here's their problem. They don't want blood on their own hands. They don't want to be the ones that actually follow through with it. So they go and devise a plan that they will take Jesus to the Judean Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And they'll try to convince him that Jesus is a threat to Rome to, so that he will execute Jesus. Now, Pontius Pilate is, 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 is quite a, a, a historical figure who's got quite a reputation, but he was a very effective governor. See, governors over different provinces were basically held with a few responsibilities. The first one is you got to keep the peace. All of the, the fights and disputes, you got to put those away. You have to collect taxes. You have to oversee public works. And you discipline those who need discipline, even to the point of execution. So, they, so, so I have to get you to, to grasp this picture before we read it. On one side of the platform stands Jesus. On the other side of the platform is a crowd of people. And in the middle is Pilate, trying to decide where his allegiance lies. And it picks up in verse 4. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis to charge anything against him. So he's saying, I, I don't see any problem with Jesus. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here's the man. And as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. Pilate's questioned him. Pilate has found no fault in him. But all of a sudden, he starts feeling the pressure that comes when you stand between the crowd and Christ. He feels this pressure to, to do what they want him to do. And, and he, he does the first thing that you do. He tries to avoid it. He, tr he tries to do anything he can to avoid the pressure that's coming from having to please the crowd. And, and so, you know, for you, like Pilate's just trying to say, you take this, but for you, here's what that looks like. You, you make sure the report's always in on time. You make sure the house is always clean. You do everything you can to make sure it's always perfect so that we never have to have those tense moments that are pointed out where you're not pleasing the person that's in your life. You'll do anything to avoid this pressure, just like Pilate. And it picks up in verse 7 and it says, The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. And when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. Pilate, for Pilate in this moment, the walls are closing in. I, I mean, he, he's trying to, to, to do the right thing, the thing he wants to do, but the crowd keeps pushing him harder and harder. You know what that's like. Yeah, I, I can stay a few extra hours and work. Yeah, I'll come back off vacation. Yes, 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 I'll loan you the money, sure. You know, you know what that's like? You know, where, where, where you, you're, you'll do anything for anyone just to keep peace, even if it means that you will just compromise your own desired behavior. 
You'll do anything you can just to keep peace. I just don't want to see this blow up anymore. I, I, whatever it takes, if I have to come home early, if I have to pay for it, whatever it is, I'll do it. Now look at verse 9. And he went back inside the palace. This is Pilate. Where did you come from, he asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or crucify you? You know what I love? People who deal with this fear, they love to flex their power over people they can. Because the truth is they feel powerless in their own life. You know, it's the person who will treat subordinates bad at the office. Like, you'll, you'll take it out on your kids, you'll kick the dog, you know, whatever it is, because you, you just have to execute some power, because the truth is, you don't have power over your own life at this moment. And, and in verse 11, it says, Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting. That's probably what you feel like. You're trying to do what you want to do, but people keep shouting. If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. No friend of Caesar. When you're bound by the fear of people, you've got to be everybody's friend. You, you can't have anyone dislike you. Everybody's got to like you. Everybody's got to be pleased with you. Everyone has to be okay, you know, admire what you wear and what you drive. And everyone has to, to approve of the standard with which you've, you've set your life to. I mean, you, you're most dependable. You're the hard worker. You're the one they count on. But then, verse 13, when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as Stone Pavement. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon, and here, here's your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate said? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. In verse 16, finally Pilate can fight no more. Finally Pilate handled, handed him over to be crucified. You know what's ironic about this passage of Scripture? Jesus is the one that appears to be bound. Jesus is the one that appears to be in bondage. But it's actually Pilate who's in bondage. <laughs> it's incredible because, you know, we don't realize that this fear of people that drives our lives, that, that alters our decisions, that leads us in a way, that it is a bondage that keeps us in, in constant comparison. You're constantly looking at someone else for approval, constantly looking at do you measure up to what the standard that's been set. But not only does this bondage keep us in comparison, it also is, it makes us give an obsession with appearance. I mean, we have, to, we have to be a part of the crowd and look with the right folk, and we want to be in that group, and, and it, everything we look like and drive and live in matters. I mean, it's so desperate that you'll check and see how many people have checked and liked your Facebook post because appearance matters so much. You know, but this bondage also keeps us from real intimacy because people can't really get to know you as long as you're trying to be what you think they want you to be. You, you really sacrifice your own identity. And then there's, you know, you really know this is active in someone's life, that this fear is enslaving someone when they consistently ask these two questions. What will people say about me and what will people think about me? I mean, now, now, we don't ask them out loud, of course. We just ask them in our minds over and over and over and over. We just constantly ask them when we're talking to someone. We, before we say what we're going to say, we say, well, what would they say about this? Before we show up, we say, well, what would they think about me about this? And it's just this prison that we exist in. And, and these two questions incarcerate us for no other reason than we start elevating someone else's opinion over God's opinion in our life. You know, we, we lift this up, that their approval so much higher that we forget about God's approval. As a matter of fact, becoming obsessed with everyone else's opinion is the quickest way to forget God's opinion of you. That, that, that's how you forget that God has anything to say about your life because you're so obsessed with what everyone else has to say about your life. But the reality is, I mean, we have to be honest that we put a lot of energy into what people think about us. I mean, we're constantly asking, do I fit in? Do you like this? Do you think, what do you think of this? How do you think of that? Do you think I'm doing the right thing? Do you think I fit in? Do you think I could be a part? 
We're constantly asking this, and suddenly, without us even realizing it, we've compromised pleasing God at the expense of pleasing people. And, and, and you know, you have to just stop and ask yourself, how does something like this happen? I mean, how does one end up bound in the fear of people? Well, it comes when we allow the enemy to exploit two very basic emotional needs in our lives. See, every human being on the planet has two basic emotional needs. These needs are present in anyone and everyone on any continent in any place, and then they're simply acceptance and identity. Everyone has to know that they're accepted, and everyone has to know that they have an identity. Otherwise, they will spend their whole lives chasing after finding that, the answer to those two things. You know, when I talk about acceptance, I'm talking about that you have to know that you are loved and that you are, are, are taken in just the way you are. That, that, that someone loves you above the way you act, someone accepts you above the way that you, you think, that you're just at a, your core, someone loves you. And, and, and for most of us, this should exist in our lives, and if it doesn't exist, we don't end up with healthy relationships because we constantly end up trying to be accepted based on what we do instead of who we are. And, and when this normally happens is when you're being raised by your parents because your parents love you regardless or should, but, but the enemy a lot of times takes circumstances and ruins this basic need in our lives from our childhood before you even had a chance this may have been already damaged in your life. Now, this, that's not the only thing we need is acceptance. The other thing we need is an identity. We have to know that we are special, unique, that there is a, a reason that we're here. We're not just part of this great fold of folks that, you know, just nameless and faceless, that we're unique. There is something so powerful about knowing that God created you and has a unique plan for your life. Equally powerful are the words that say, there's nothing special about you. And there's actually something wrong with you. You know, when we, when we hear these two things and they're compromised, and you know this is true because you've seen people live their whole lives looking for acceptance from, from man to man to man and looking from identity from job to job to job. Trying to feed these. And what people always do is when we don't have these basic needs met, we view all of life through the wounds that come from these two things. And when we do, we end up making decisions that support fear, that compromise who we want to be, that compromise the two most important things in your life, which are this, your relationship to God that's based in acceptance and your relationship with yourself that's based in identity. You say, what does that look like? When, when you are bound by the fear of people, You'll do anything and everything for their approval at the expense of considering God's approval. It means that you'll go your whole life on a wild goose chase for a golden egg that does not exist. That, that you'll literally spend your whole life trying to please people because you desire to please God, but you don't realize it. And here's the problem. There is no satisfaction in pleasing people. It never fills you up. It, there's never enough, and it impairs the whole time your relationship with God. But it doesn't stop there. Not only does that compromise keep you from knowing God, it keeps you from knowing yourself. When you don't know your identity, you go searching for one, and you allow this crew in high school to help you find one, and then this group in college to help you find one, and then this one at the workplace, and it's how you end up in places you wish you didn't end up with people that you one day stop and look and say, how am I, is it that these people are helping me make the decisions for my life? It's because you have spent your whole entire life looking for an identity. And in this identity that you're so desperately searching for, here's the worst part. You start making choices, not, not that you approve of, but they approve of. And you know what that results in? Choices result in you ending up being the person they want you to be instead of who you want to be. And some of you look in the mirror every morning and you think, who is this? Because it's not the person you chose, it's who they chose. Now here's the craziest thing of all of it. It's an addiction. People pleasing is an addiction, just like, like drug addiction. I mean, to, to what the drug, the, the, the addict needs of the drug, people pleasers need of approval. You know, there's a book that's called The Disease to Please. 
And in this book, they list four things that pleasers have to have, four things that, pe- that pleasers struggle with. And, 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 and I thought this was pretty interesting. Pleasers struggle, these symptoms of being a pleaser, number one is a tendency to take criticism personally. Mm. A constant fear of rejection from others. Difficulty in expressing their true feelings. Here's the best one. Here's the best one. Now, don't look side to side on this one, all right? Just keep you straight ahead. Reluctance to say no, even when it's clear they should. Sound familiar? Yes. Know anybody like that? Yes. See, we've all got a little of this in us. So how do you find freedom from being bound by the fear of people? How, how do you do that? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you three quick things. Three things that I guarantee will help you find freedom from being bound by the fear of people. And the first one is this. Know who you are in Christ. In Christ. Highlight, asterisk, you know, whatever you need to do in Christ. Highlight that. You know, when, when I was young, my dad was the general manager of a, a steakhouse. And, and, and he, um, I spent a lot of time with him. My mom would drop him off as she'd go to school at that steakhouse. Now, here's the deal. I know what you're thinking. Yeah, duh, I can see that, okay? So, but, but here's the thing. I spent a ton of time there. And, 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 and I, I mean, I just had run of the place. I mean, I, I would go anywhere I wanted to go. I'd go to the back and talk to the chefs. I ate anything I wanted to eat. I mean, I'd order the most expensive thing on the menu and just put it on somebody's tab. I mean, I, I would even go around and point out things that I just thought would need to be changed, that need to be done a different way. Now, I also know what you're thinking at this point. is like, wow, that sounds like a pretty annoying kid. Um, but, but here's the truth. Why would I do all that? Because I'm the son of the guy who's in charge. I, I'm, I'm the son of the guy that's in charge. You will not believe the confidence that you start walking with when you realize you're the son or daughter of the guy that's in charge. And, 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 and some of us are acting like we're the slave of the one who's in charge. But, but the truth is, when you're the son or daughter, you, you just you kind of don't care what other people think because your dad's in charge. And, and, and let, let me put it this way. You'll never know who you are until you know whose you are. You're never going to know who you are until you know whose you are. Look look at this in Romans 8. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he, what's that word there? Adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, which is not like this, this idea of, of he's just, you know, that's my biological father. No, no, no. Like that's an affectionate. Like it's when my kids call me daddy. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. That means everything he gets, we get. Now l- 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 listen to me. When, f- when the sp- fear of people starts rising in you, you need to go check your adoption papers. Okay, now I've got a friend who's in the process of adopting a little girl from Africa. And, and, and you may not realize it or not, but they don't give kids away. I mean, he has to choose her. An enormous amount of study and paperwork went into choosing that little girl. And not only did he choose her, he had to pay a significant price for her. And then on top of that, he has to accept her. That it's not one of these things where she comes and she'd better just get with the program. They're changing their whole life to accept her because they want a relationship with her. Your heavenly father has done the exact same thing. He chose you. He paid an enormously high price for you. And he's done everything he can with any, your whole life orchestrating it to accept you and bring you because ultimately he wants a relationship with you. And if you'll lean into this relationship with God, I mean like a real relationship, you'll never fear people again in your life. You know, it's like this. Because the person who's intimate with God will never fear people. If you know what God thinks of you, you know who you are in Christ, you're never going to worry about what somebody else thinks about you. You're never going to need that approval from anybody else because you realize you're a son or daughter. Now, now, here's the second thing. Understand pleasing God often means disappointing people. That's tough. 
The Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 4, On the contrary, we speak as though approved by God. Notice what Paul's saying here. First of all, I know that I am a son or daughter of God, entrusted with the gospel. And he says, hey, I'm not trying to please people but God. How much trying do you put into pleasing people? You know, if Paul, who really accomplished more than anyone on the face of the planet besides Jesus... If Paul was here today, here's what he would tell you two things when it comes to, to, to this idea. Number one, you cannot please people. You cannot. It may appear at moments that people are pleased. It may, you may assume that for a moment things are okay, but they are not able to be pleased. If you commit your life to pleasing people, you are committing your life to a, just a hamster's wheel of running that never end up anywhere. There will always be someone to criticize you, always be someone to look down on you, always someone who wants more from you. You cannot please people. And I know that we tell ourselves this lie that that if we just do this time, if we just do it this time, if it's just one more time, that eventually they will be pleased, but they will not. Do you know what actually is happening? They are realizing that you will do anything to placate them and make them happy, and they are going to exploit that weakness for the rest of your life. You cannot please people. But here's what Paul would say. And it's good news. But you can please God. You cannot please people, but you can please God. You know, and, and, and it's very simple. And I know that people like to complicate this, but it's actually quite simple because all you have to do is want to live for an audience of one. That literally, when you wake up in the morning, all you have to say is, God, I just want to please you today. Whatever I have to say, whatever I need to do, whatever I need to walk, whoever I need to talk to, wherever I need to, I just want to please you today. And if you'll wake up with that thinking in your mind, you will please God. Because pleasing God is not a destination, it's, a, it's, it's, it's just a direction in your life. So many people think pleasing God is when we can check off so many of these boxes and we've accomplished all these things. That's not what God's looking for. God just wants to see that your heart is bent towards Him. That's all He's looking for. And and so we cannot please people, but we can please God. You know, do you know the only way that you're ever going to accomplish what's in your heart? The only way that you will ever live to the fullest of your potential is to please the one person who created both of them. It just pains me to think of people who have so much potential and so much to give this world that are living the blueprint of someone else's life and not the one that God created them for. So you've got to you got to know who you are in Christ. You got to realize you're going to have to. Let's just practice this. I, I think. Let me help you. Now I'm going to teach you a new word. Okay. No. Okay. Hey, let's say it together. No. Come on, with a little passion. No. So when someone asks you and there's something that you feel like is compromising who you are, who Christ has created you to be, and it is not pleasing to God, you simply say, no. Look at that. Look how powerful they're. I mean, that's just a powerful principle in your life to be able to say, no. You're going to have to disappoint people if you want to please God. But here's the last one. Live in God's love. 1 John 4, 18. Let me just say this before I read this. There is nothing that I will say in this next section that you have not heard. There is nothing that I will say in this next section that really, if you just hear it, will make any difference in your life. But there is something supernatural about this next section, if you will make your heart open to it, that God will throw a grenade in your heart and leave lasting impact if you'll accept his love. Now with that, let's read 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We as humans are prone to try to cure our fear. I mean, you'll do anything you can to try to cure your fear, but John clearly states that the only thing that can happen to cure fear is an acceptance of God's love. Because fear and love cannot exist in the same place. Now, here's the conundrum that for me, and probably for you, I have heard my whole life, God loves me. 
I've seen it on every bumper sticker. I've heard it in sermons. I can quote it in songs. And, and, and here's the, the conundrum of it all is that we believe God loves. We believe God can love you. We just struggle to believe that God would want to and can love me. See, you, you believe that God loves. You believe that he loves other people. You just struggle to believe that he loves you. And, and, and it's with that, that that we struggle. It's where this, this understanding stops. It's why fear still exists in our lives. Because if you understand God really loves you, fear cannot exist in your life. It literally, the Bible says, flushes fear out of your life when you understand God loves you. And you live with that reality. But as soon as we hear God loves you, we immediately, with cat-like quickness, think but my life doesn't appear to love God. That, that I'm not, you know, to, to, we, we think to love means that we have to love, then he loves us, and there's this, this, this reciprocal thing. But that's not true. Look at 1 John 4.10. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. God, it wasn't one of these things where all of a sudden you started having an affection for God, and God's like, Oh, well, yeah, well, I might come over and love you. No, 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 no. What this says is, is that it's never been about your love. It's always been about his magnificent love, his love that you weren't even aware of. He loved you before you even knew he existed. He is crazy about you. There is nothing that you can do to make him love you more, nothing you can do to make him love you less. It's because God does not do love. God is love. It's all he is. It's all he knows how to do. It's the only thing he can, so therefore God loves you, period. But as soon as, as soon as we think that, we get in our minds, but Pastor Joe, you don't know, I've done some awful things. And, and, and if you've ever felt separation from God because of sin, you're not alone. This room is full of people like that. But here, look, look again, 1 Peter 4, 8. Love covers over a multitude of sins. No matter what you have done, God's love and forgiveness is bigger than the biggest sin that you have for this very reason. It is unconditional. It, it, is, it is not based upon your performance. It is not like the junior high girl who picks up a daisy and says, he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. I had a good day at work, he loves me. I talked bad to my spouse, he loves me not. I, I, you know, I, I went to church this week. He loves me. I missed it the next week. He loves me not. I, I helped someone in need. He loves me. I walked past that homeless guy this week. He loves me not. I read and prayed this week. He loves me. I skipped reading and praying and played golf. He loves me not. That is, that is you know, it's, it's so crazy, the contradiction of people not outside the church. It's inside the church, the people who struggle with this. We for, we'll, we'll gladly preach God's love is unconditional until we do something conditional. <laughs> we'll believe that anyone can be loved by God until the moment we mess up. And then we think the moment we mess up, his love stops for us. Your love may fluctuate. Your love may rise and fall. Your love may be something that can be earned. Your love may be something that, that someone else can give you something and it goes up on the meter. His love is unchanging. It is constant. It cannot be moved in any way, shape, or form. It is not based on what you do. It is based on who he is. God's love is sacrificial, unconditional, and always giving. It is greater than you, you can even comprehend. And, and, and I know what you're thinking. God knows you on your best day, and he knows you on your worst day. He knows you when you have good thoughts, and he loves you when you have terrible thoughts. He knows you in every way, shape, and form that you've ever to be known. He knows your imperfections. He knows the miscues. He knows everything that's wrong about you relationally, everything that's missing emotionally. He knows everything about you that, you're, that you struggle to to tell other people the secrets that you hide. He knows them all. There's nothing that he doesn't know that you regret, nothing that you don't hold of guilt that he doesn't already know. His love is so unconditional that there is not a thing that can separate you from it. As a matter of fact, he did not see you on your best day and love you. He saw you on your worst day and loved you because he decided that there is not a high enough price that he will not be separated from you. So he will do anything and go to any distance to let you know he loves you. 
because his love is unconditional. And if his love is unconditional, and if we are loved, what can we fear? I mean, if, 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 if we're loved by God, what fear is there? His love will always provide. His love will always protect. His love will always guide. It will always fulfill. It will always heal. It will always reach to the deepest parts of our lives. What is there to fear if we're loved by God? If you will make yourself available to the love of God, if you accept the love of God, if you'll become aware of the love of God, if you'll bask in the love of God, every bit of fear in your life will be obliterated. It cannot exist because you realize the one who hung the moon and the stars loves you. And like I said, there ain't nothing you don't know already. But if the Holy Spirit at this moment will touch you, It'll revolutionize your life. I pray right now that the love of God would become a reality into every heart today. That the love of God would pour over people. That it would press out every ounce of fear. That it would flush out every bit of anxiety. That it literally would seep out every bit of worry. For if God be for us, who can be against us? I pray that the love of God would be so powerful, it would heal 30 and 40 year old wounds. That the love of God be so profound that it will rearrange thinking and mindsets that are wrong. That the love of God will take someone who hides in the shadows and is ashamed of who they are and will let them step forward boldly as a child of God. I pray the love of God in revelation form, that it would not be heard with ears, but it would be heard in the heart of men and women here today. For the love of God will not fail. It is more powerful than any concept so powerful that it would drive a Savior to a cross at the expense of losing relationship with us. I pray the love of God into every heart today. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you don't know the love of God, that he sacrificed himself and gave himself in your place because he loved you so much. But today, you sense God doing something in you and you want to know him as Savior. You want to follow him with the rest of your life. If that's you today, while every head bowed, every eyes closed, I want you to stick your hand up because I want to pray with you. Just take that step. I'm raising my hand because I want to follow Christ. I want to follow Christ. I want to follow Christ. I see that hand. God loves you. I see that hand, 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 God loves you. Right now on the screen, there's a prayer. There's nothing magical about this prayer except for that it's just helping put words to what's going on in your heart in this moment. And I'd like to lead you in it as our family continues to pray for us. Heavenly Father, I admit that I'm a sinner and that I am lost without you. I believe Christ died in my place, making a way for us to have a relationship. I choose to follow Jesus and his way for the rest of my life. Father, I pray that the love of God would become so real to those people right now that, God, every bit of shame and guilt and condemnation would fall off and that, God, they would live right now knowing they are a child of God. I pray, Lord, that they would just sense you doing something in them, creating in them a new creation. And I just believe this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me, if you prayed that prayer, the worst thing you can do is go back into isolation, just go back to things that they were. The church's job is to help you. We're not not God. We're not your relationship with God. We help you build a relationship with God, and that's what this is. There is a card in front of you. I want you to take that card out, and I want you to fill it out. There's a box that says that you've committed your life to Christ. Do that right now. 
because we're going to help you. We're not going to hassle you in any way, shape, or form. Take that card, fill it out, go to Connect Central today. No one's going to embarrass you. You take that card to Connect Central, and we want to give you a gift. We want to give you a Bible. That's God's love letter to you. And we want to give that to you today as a gift, and we're just here to help you in any way, shape, or form. Take that card out, fill it out, take it to Connect Central today, and and I promise we're going to do our best to help you. Now, if everybody else will stand this morning. Here's the reality. I lived my whole life. I was in ministry, and I didn't know the love of God for me. You can be close to Jesus and your heart be far from Jesus. You don't think that's true? Judas is a great example. Constant proximity does not mean you were transformed. And so you've got to grasp. None of the, Let me just be honest with you. None of this is going to work. None of you coming to church. None of you trying to. I mean, none of it's going to work without the love of God. You'll just end up killing yourself. And you'll be mad at God because you killed yourself and the whole time he's been loving you. You've got to get a revelation, and I don't say a knowledge, a revelation of the love of God, that you are loved, and it'll break fear in your life in any way, shape, or form. I'm going to pray over you, and I'm going to encourage you as they sing this song. And and you know what I love about this song is it repeats the same thing again, and I know that annoys some people, but you know why? It's because we're so dense. We don't get it. We don't get that he loves us, and we have to sing it over and over so that hopefully one time it'll catch. And we're we're going to sing this song. And I just want you to say, God, I need to know your love. But before we do, I, I want to pray for you. And I really sense the Holy Spirit saying to me in worship that there are people here who are living with the fear of people that aren't even alive anymore. You're living, and the first thing you ask yourself is, What would my dad think? Some people are living and saying, what what would mom want me to do? And that's a fear of people, even though they've meant something to you in your life. You live for an audience of one. What pleases God? And at thinking, what pleases God is the quickest way to forget what other people think about you. So Father, we pray right now in the name of Jesus, You'd break the fear of people over our lives. Let us not be a slave to any man, for we are child of God. Lord, I pray that every person here would know who they are in Christ, that every person here would be able to have the courage and the boldness to please God above man. And that, Lord Jesus, we would live in your love. We wouldn't know about your love. We wouldn't have considered your love. We wouldn't have even encountered your love. We would live in it. It is a constant state with which we require to be in. God, I pray that you would do that in the hearts. Where my words fail, Holy Spirit, do it in hearts. Where our conceptualization of it fails, God, do it in hearts. I pray there would be people who understand God loves them. And let it flush away every fear. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this message was an encouragement to you to live a life fully devoted to God. For more information about Twin Rivers Worship Center, or if you would like to partner with this church's ministry in St. Louis, Missouri, and around the world by giving, visit us at our website at trwc.com. We would love for you to join us in a worship service at one of our two locations sometime. Have a great day and be blessed.